am occupying the Florida House chamber floors. An unprecedented scene at the state capitol. The governor won this battle and Floridians lost. An unprecedented rush of maps and laws. The state is governed by the interests of the people of the state of Florida. So Disney poked the bear. DeSantis versus Disney, Republicans deliver. We're going to talk about the issues that are actually impacting people's lives. The agriculture commissioner and the candidates war on two fronts. The governor has dropped the ball. Clapping back at state Republicans and filing suit against the Biden administration. Miami, you are about to get f***ed. Shot across the bow. Don't bend over for Beckham. From a surprising source. The city's not putting a penny into the deal. Public golf course or private soccer complex. Miami preps for a vote. Or does it? A week of firsts and surprises all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. What a week it is. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg, and what a show we have for you. <laughs> but we'll begin with the end, the end of a special session of the legislature like Florida has never experienced. With lightning speed for Republicans, thunderous protests from Democrats, lawmakers delivered the governor's wish list. First, they approved the congressional map that his office drew up, and it cuts minority districts in half. Then they took down Disney's special tax district. It was revenge by the governor for Disney opposing the parental rights and education bill, the one that the opponents call Don't Say Gay. Representative Randy Fine carried that bill in the House. He was the sponsor. He is a Republican from Palm City in Brevard County. And there he is, Representative Fine. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's uh, begin with sort of a basic question you were the sponsor of that redistricting map in the house and it was obviously approved signed into law it cuts the number of black congressional districts in the state or districts likely to vote for a black candidate from four to two is that fair is it legal is it constitutional sure and just to correct you i wasn't the sponsor of the map but i was the vice chairman of the full redistricting committee to, to answer your question to answer your question, though, look, there are there are two schools of thought on this, and one is that no race should be receive preference in the creation of of districts. That we should not racially gerrymander the state. Something that Democrats did for over a hundred years in this state. This map is focused on organizing based on geography and making sure every voter in Florida has an equal right to select the candidate of their choice. Democrats wished to actually disenfranchise millions of voters across the state, and we stood up against that. Well, how how disenfranchise? I frankly just don't understand. I don't think they were. I didn't hear any Democrat trying to disenfranchise. What they were saying, essentially, as I heard it, was we are trying to repair a racial injustice from over 100 years ago and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Constitutional Fair Districts Amendment were steps to try to do that, weren't they? Sure. So I'd say this, those hundred years of maps were all created by Democrats. So I understand why they don't want to focus on that. But what I would note is they were advocating for a world in in which 35 percent of the population of a congressional district could guarantee the candidate of their choice. When you guarantee 35 percent the right to pick a candidate of their choice, you're guaranteeing that 65 percent have no say at all. This was a massive effort to disenfranchise millions of Florida voters, and I'm glad that Ron DeSantis stood up to it. Representative Fine, you did carry the Disney bill in the, I did. In the House of Representatives. There you go. And, um, there we've been talking about that all week that was lightning fast we knew it was going to happen the moment the governor broached it uh heard you talk about it uh, for several days you are a very conservative republican you value free speech you value free markets reconcile then for us how kicking the hornet's nest which were your words and the clap <laughs> back from re republicans as punishment for disney how do you reconcile that with allowing corporate free speech corporate free markets 
Um, I, I just reject the premise of the question. Over 150 companies signed a letter uh, opposing our parental rights and education bill. We didn't target any of them. But Disney chose to take advantage of special privileges that they have in this state that no Floridian enjoys and no other company enjoys to repudiate the state, its elected representatives, its governor, and its voters. If you're going to ask for special privileges, then you need to be on your best behavior. They weren't. And th what ended up happening is we realized that there were these special districts that were created before the Florida Constitution was put in place that had many provisions that just didn't make sense anymore. So to your point, this was their special their special district was before the Constitution. Uh, they weren't given any special privileges. They were assisted in creating Disney World for Florida. But the other bill that that took away their carve out in the new social media law that was a carve out for Disney was given to them by essentially this, the same legislature. Yeah, and look, I think that's the idea of the session is you shouldn't get special privileges. Look, Disney has four theme parks and had the right to not follow our safety codes, our road building codes, our environmental codes, our zoning codes. Universal Orlando that's building its third theme park, they don't get these special privileges. SeaWorld doesn't get them. Busch Gardens doesn't get them. Legoland doesn't get them. If you want to talk about free markets, I think we should probably treat everyone the same. Yeah. Uh, Representative Fine, as you well know, uh, Disney over the years since 1967 has given millions of dollars to Florida politicians, governors, members of the legislature, uh, lobbied to get special privileges. And in fact, you know, got several like that carve out that the governor uh, got rid of that you all got rid of. Uh, on the other hand, when they came to Florida, there had to be incentives to bring them here. The incentive was the Reedy Creek Improvement District. Now, that's not sort of written, you know, on stone, and it was right perhaps for you guys to uh, do away with it, but, you know, let's call it what it is. I mean, that was revenge, was it not, by the governor? No, I don't think so. Look, there were 133 special districts before the Constitution was approved in 1968. 127 of them had been updated. These six had not. Little history lesson, Reedy Creek was created when Disney promised that they would actually build a city where Disney World is with housing and things like that. That never happened, yet this was never updated. What happened here is when Disney chose to alienate the voters of Florida, they drained their political power, which had prevented the legislature from taking a look at these special privileges for the last 50 years. I think what it shows is under Ron DeSantis and representatives like me, you may have a lot of money, you may have a lot of power, but we're still gonna do the right thing. So would then under, under that argument, wouldn't it have been possible to let the market decide, let the parents who might've been furious with Disney for opposing that bill mm -hmm. to just not go to Disney World anymore? <laughs> Well, we're still going to do that. Um, we're still going to do that, but we're also going to say those special privileges that you've enjoyed as a company that your competitors don't have, I think those need to be taken a look at. Look, Disney had the right to build a nuclear power plant on their property. They had the right to ignore our zoning laws. They had the right to seize private property from people who did not live in that district without their consent. Extraordinary powers that maybe made sense in 1967, but they don't make sense in 2022. Yeah, Representative Fine, as you well know, Disney has outstanding debt of about a billion dollars, and uh, they pay, what, $163 million in tax revenue every year. So um, what is Orange County, Osceola County, going to have to absorb the people who live there, are their property taxes going to go up? Yeah, let me clarify that question. Disney does not have that $1.1 billion in debt. A local government, the Reedy Creek Improvement District does. And whenever you dissolve a special district, those debts get transferred to the municipalities where those special districts exist. But so do the tax revenues as well. You get the benefit, the costs, but you also get the benefits. This won't create any tax increase. And frankly, is being that's being pushed by the same people who claimed that we passed a bill that said, don't say gay. They lied to voters then, they're doing it again now. To, to your point, it is a parents' rights bill, though the portion of the now law that's controversial is that one paragraph that talks about what can and cannot be taught in early education. Um, there were seven of your colleagues in the House, mostly from South Florida, who voted against that bill, who were Republicans, seven Republicans in the House, only two Republicans 
in the Senate. Um, I'm going to ask you a little bit of an inside baseball question, only because we, we have an inside baseball kind of audience uh, on Sundays. <laughs> and in the House, Senator Jennifer Bradley was your counterpart in carrying this bill in the House. She was one of the two Republicans in the Senate who opposed the parents' rights bill. How do you think that happened? How did she get to be the one to now carry the bill that punished Disney for it? Well, again, I reject the premise that we punished Disney, and I don't know why Senator Bradley was Well, wait, was kicking asked the that hornet's I, nest. They kicked the yeah, hornet's I, nest. Those I do, are your Well, words. no, when you kick the hornet's nest, sometimes you discover issues. The analogy that I've described as well, which I don't know if you covered, is when we found that UCF had misappropriated $85 million several years ago. That kicked the hornet's nest, and we made wide-ranging changes that affected all 40 of our universities. They're not necessarily punitive. But in the case of Jennifer Bradley, I believe that she ran the bill that gave Disney that special carve out um, for Disney Plus. And so it sort of made sense for her to go back and correct it. Yeah. In the brief time we have left, I do want to ask you, uh, we ran a report. I did a report on, I think, uh, Friday of this week after some black state lawmakers, House members who had staged a demonstration on the House floor to show their displeasure with passing the the new congressional map, uh, and you were on camera as saying, you know, if they broke the law, let's put them in jail. Let's do that. I mean, isn't that kind of a draconian response to a traditional civil rights uh, demonstration? Oh, no, no. What happened on the floor of the Florida House was far worse than what happened in Washington on January 6th. Worse? Constitution how, how constitutional so? officers that took an oath to protect the Constitution attempted to prohibit the Florida legislature from getting its business done, from actually creating the ability for Florida to send Congress people to Washington, D.C., to the point where we had to pass this Disney bill without a single member getting the opportunity to debate. 21 million Floridians were disenfranchised because of sedition on the part of these Democrats. They absolutely broke the law. It's a second degree felony what happened. And I do hope there's accountability for it. Well, having none of them here to counter that, we'll just leave it at there is no breaking and entering. We will look up those laws. We will follow up on what you're talking about. And Representative Randy Fine, it is great to have you on the program. I hope this won't be the last time. Happy great to do to it see anytime. You. Thank, thanks for your time this morning, Representative. Two Democrats aiming to unseat the governor came to South Florida this week. Nikki Freed is one of them, and she also is suing her own party's administration. We'll be with her. Ask her about that next. <clears throat> Believe it or not, just four months now until the August primaries, and the race for governor is really ramping up. Of the candidates vying to be the Democrat who challenges Governor Ron DeSantis, two of them brought their campaigns right here to South Florida this week. Charlie Chris, now a congressman, and Nikki Freed, Florida's commissioner of agriculture, both here making their cases about why he or she would be the Democrats' best chance to unseat the governor. Nikki Freed is with us live today via Zoom. Uh, Commissioner, welcome. We're glad to see you as always. Good morning. Good I guess morning. We, it's so I good guess to see you add, both. You, there is a, a third Democrat vying for that uh, opportunity, Annette Tadeo, Se Senator Annette Tadeo. I don't want, want to give her short shrift today, but Nikki Freed, great to have you. All right. Thank you. Um, Nikki, and we know each other, so I'm just going to use first names here, if you don't yes. mind. <laughs> we um, know each other a long time. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. So let's start with the baseline question. Uh, as Glenn had just said, Annette Tadeo, Charlie, Chris, are your opponents here vying for the nomination? Why are you the best choice for Democrats? And why would you, better than they, uh, defeat uh, Governor Ron DeSantis? You know, first of all, Democrats are looking for somebody who's going to stand up to the nonsense that we just heard from Representative Randy Fine and be able to not just be able to counterpoint it, but show them that show the people of our state the ludicrousy uh, of those arguments. And I've been doing it for three and a half years, standing up against this type of rhetoric and one in 2018. That is something that Democrats have to understand that if we are going to win and we are going to not just save democracy for our state, but for the nation, then we need somebody who has a proven track record of winning, has a, a laundry list of accomplishments, not just as commissioner, but when I was fighting for homeowners during the foreclosure crisis right in South Florida, to when I was a public defender fighting for a justice in our system. That's what Democrats are looking for, somebody who can win, 
somebody who understands all of the moving parts of our state, and somebody who's going to be able to unify our state. Look, in 2018, um, I outperformed the top of the ticket when it came to votes in South Florida, had more crossover votes than we've seen in almost any election. I know how to win our state. I've got the right messaging, talking to the people of our state, and making sure that we have somebody who's going to show up for them every day and fight. Okay, that's that could be like your campaign speech right there, and, and maybe it is. But let's talk about the news of the week right now. Um, kind of an eyebrow-raising development, this lawsuit that you fire, filed against your party's own Biden administration. Uh, and it's over medical marijuana, people who use medical marijuana in Florida at the moment legally cannot own guns, cannot purchase guns. Your department uh, sort of oversees both. Why did you file this lawsuit? Could, couldn't that be handled in a less um, aggressive way? Look, Lana and Michael, you know um, from all the times that we've talked and everybody across the state knows that legalization and inequities of the medical marijuana laws of our state have been something that I have been championing on and fighting for um, for decades at this point. And Congress it has not moved. And so seeing not just on, on this issue when it comes to, to gun rights, but we see people all across our state who are using medical marijuana, being fired from jobs, VA uh, veterans not being able to get their VA benefits, losing of their housing. Um, so there's a lot of rights right now that medical marijuana users um, are being deprived of because they're choosing a medicine that is, is a guaranteed right also in our constitution if you become a medical patient. And this is something that I have been working on for years, and specifically on this one since I became commissioner. And we have been working on it um, for since I became got into office. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we had this pandemic, and that had to be our priority, making sure that we have all hands on deck to get our state and our country through the pandemic. And look, this is supposed to be a friendly lawsuit with the Biden administration. We've been talking to them. We told them, we've called them beforehand. Uh, we said, look, this is an opportunity for us to work together to make some changes to the ATF yeah. form. And this is ultimately going to make people more safe. Now, we as Democrats have, you know, things that we're talking about as common sense gun regulations. And that includes everybody receiving a complete background check when purchasing a gun. Right now, we're forcing medical marijuana patients into illegal markets and or lying on this form, which is a felony. So okay, this is so an opportunity let, let me, to showcase. Let, let me just go under the under the theory that every time an elected official who's running for something does something, it kind of crosses both service and campaigning. And so in, in the other sort of direction, this lawsuit really has the attention in a way of Republicans as well. Was that your intention? Look, this issue, we all know. Medical marijuana and legalization crosses party lines. That's how I won in 2018. Coming up with issues that are common sense that people across our state believe in. We voted 72% for medical marijuana. If you pull legalization across the country and across our state, it is over 60%. This is something that needs to be fixed in, in Congress. This needs to be fixed on getting um, more people opportunities to participate in this new green industry. This is something that's crossing party lines. Uh, this is why, going back to our first question, why I am Democrats' best chance to defeat Ron DeSantis in November. Yeah. Uh, Nikki, I understand that there are 771,000 Floridians who have qualified for a medical marijuana permit. I don't know exactly what license, you know, you have to go to a doctor to get it. You, in fact, have one of those, do you not? I do. And Are, I've been very vocal about that. It's one of the things that I ran and, on to make what, sure that what, we're... Why, I'm right. sorry, why, why do you, because, you know, the legislation made it fairly clear that this was principally for people with Parkinson's or ALS or serious cancer, awful pain. What, what, what is your reason for having a medical marijuana permit? You know, first off, you know, this is a, a personal medical issue, but I certainly have been very open about it, um, that I've experienced PTSD. And that's another issue that we're seeing. One of the reasons why this even was in our constitution and why it's been pushed all across our country is because of individuals, and especially um, our, our veterans who are coming back um, and are having PTSD and are looking for other alternatives uh, than the other types of medications that have been prescribed to them, alcohol, or in some effects, you know, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of our veterans uh, commit suicide. 
So PTSD has been a huge aspect of moving our country forward on legalization and destigmatizing uh, the medical marijuana. Nikki Freed, sit tight. We have a quick break to do. We'll be right back with more conversation when we come back. Thank you. We are back with candidate for governor and Agriculture and Consumer Services Commissioner Nikki Free, the longest title in state government. <laughs> um, so, Nikki, let's let's talk about the campaign a little bit. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker, endorsed Charlie Crist f f for this. What what is your take on that? That actually surprised the actual endorsement surprised a lot of people here. Not not that she would or wouldn't, just that. So uh, before I get all tangled up in something I probably shouldn't be saying, what do you think? You know, we, we, we all know that, that Charlie has friends in Washington, D.C. Uh, my goal is to protect the people of our state, to focus on the issues here uh, and, and not focusing on what's happening in Washington, focusing on Florida. So, OK, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. That's happening here. The House Speaker endorsed a Florida <clears throat> candidate for governor. What do you make of that? Yeah, I said, you know, he has friends in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think that also shows a really big disconnect of where the people of our state are when it comes to their policies and coming to their politics. Uh, and again, I think it shows a real disconnect um, that Charlie has on the people of our state and what their issues are. Yeah. Nikki, yesterday afternoon, you were in Homestead at what was billed as a gubernatorial candidates forum. You were there. And they had invited Charlie Crist. He was a no-show. Now, I don't yep. know whether he had ever confirmed his appearance, but he wasn't there. You were. And in the course of this, you said we ought to have five statewide debates uh, before the August 23rd primary. Is that realistic? I mean, you think they're going to be two debates? <laughs> you know, look, I, he did confirm. Um, he did confirm. We moved out around our entire schedule to be down to show up for the people of South Dade uh, and show up for the people of our state. He dropped out the night before. Um, so he didn't want to come onto stage and to actually have those conversations about issues, about what is impacting people today, uh, going on the record about our past um, issues that he has not been good on, including reproductive rights, uh, including the LGBTQ, including criminal justice. I mean, there's a litany of issues uh, that Charlie Chris has to be accountable for, for his past. And so being the fact that he refused to show up yesterday um, at this forum, we called on five debates. And so I hope that he takes that, that challenge and is willing to come onto stage with me and have a real conversation about who we are, where we come from, what we're willing to fight for, and give a real differences, because there are, uh, showing to the people of our state and the Democrats, uh, who is that true Democrat who's going to stand up for the things that we all believe in, and who's going to be our champion in, in Tallahassee. And unfortunately, uh, the people of our state didn't get that opportunity yesterday to see those differences. Uh, just, I just want to put on the record, in fairness, we here actually don't know why he didn't show up and what his reasons are. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, Nikki Freed, when uh, Michael and I were talking just a little while ago, affordable housing is actually one of our community's <laughs> biggest issues. And I know that's something that you have a plan for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, look, when I first launched this campaign, uh, I did a listening tour all across our state, getting it buy-ins from people about what is on their minds. And let me tell you that the number one thing that I heard consistently, whether I was in Key West, I was in Central Florida, I was in the Panhandle, was affordability. And so we have to be declaring a state of emergency. I've asked the governor to do so. Uh, he has refused to. So on day one of my governorship, that's what we're going to do, because that is exactly what's happening. Yeah, if Off I could going, jump in, in the camps, I beg your pardon. But, you know, the legislature this year, once again, took $100 million out of the Sadowski Housing Trust, which helps people buy houses. And, you know, uh, I, I, as governor, would you stop that? Yeah, first of all, Michael, you're correct. We have now calculated that since Jeb Bush, so Jeb, Charlie, Rick, and Ron collectively have gutted $2.3 billion from that trust fund. Can you imagine how many affordable homes and, and complexes could have been built over the last 25 years? And so I have said, I will never sign a budget that is laid on my desk that touches one cent from the affordable child trust housing. Uh, that is just unacceptable that shows that this Republican legislators and these Republican governors uh, did not have the people as a priority. 
You know, Charlie gutted over $530 billion, a million dollars from the Sadowski Fund. Yeah. That's something that I want to talk about and, and show the people well, of our state and, that we've got a plan, including having um, an increase of our exe um, homestead exemption from yeah. 50000 to 100000 and anything over 10% rent increases is price gouging because that's exactly what it is. Yeah, well, we are going to invite you. We're inviting you right now. Glenn and I want you and Charlie and Annette to come on this program and you can certainly have a full hour to debate each other and I hope you will say yes, I'll do that. Absolutely, anytime, any place. Um, I think that we have to talk to, about the issues and for the people of our state to see the clear differences um, between uh, myself and my opponents. All right, Nikki Freed, thank you so much. Thanks we so appreciate much. it. Absolutely. Thank Next, the filmmaker and the ex-Marlins president who made Stadium Deal the most feared words in South Florida. Boy, what a lineup. Billy Corbin and David Sampson, they teamed up on a viral takedown, and they're going to join us next. For nearly a decade, soccer star David Beckham and his Miami business partner Jorge Mas have worked to get a soccer stadium built in Miami. Right now, they've been negotiating a 99-year no-bid lease to develop the city of Miami's Mel Reese Public Golf Course near MIA into a private soccer, entertainment, and retail complex. Complex being an understatement in Miami terms, and after a number of delays, the commission may or may not keep its date to vote on it this week. And headlining the opposition now is this. Miami is known for sun, fun, and sex. In Miami, you are about to get f***ed. These five commissioners are voting on the biggest real estate deal in the history of Miami. And if you thought the Marlins Park deal was shitty, wait until you get a load of this. The city wants to give billionaire Jorge Mas, David Beckham, and their Inter-Miami soccer team a 99-year no-bid lease below market value on 131 acres of parkland. So filmmaker <laughs> Billy Corbin, raconteur films, made that mini documentary, and that's kind of right in his wheelhouse. But the narrator, poof, bombshell. <laughs> David Sampson, the former president of the Marlins, largely credited with pulling off the worst stadium deal for Miami-Dade taxpayers in the history of the world. <laughs> so good to have you both. And there they are you on screen right now. Got a lot of explaining to do. Billy, who, well, who recruited who for doing this mini documentary? Talk. Oh, well, I recruited David Sampson. There's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, when Clarice Starling uh, needed help uh, capturing <laughs> Buffalo Bill, she went to Hannibal Lecter. So that's what I did. Put the lotion in the basket. David, <laughs> da I, David, I just want to tell you, one of our colleagues saw you in a deli or something with uh, one of your children and said that you looked like you were a really good dad, but you truly were the most hated man in Miami and possibly still are in Miami-Dade, and you know that, and, you know, it seems like you're kind of proud of that. Why are you doing this? What, what is your motive for this opposition? Well, I would like the number of the person. First of all, maybe you could call my daughter, because if all it takes to be a good dad is to go to a deli and get a schmear, <laughs> then I would say there's a lot of good are, are dads out there. Are you saying you're not? There. I'm saying that I could be better. There's no doubt about that. But a schmear is not the difference maker. So Billy Corbin called me, and he said, listen, I have an idea for a script I'm writing. Would you be willing to narrate a bit about the Mel Reese and the soccer stadium deal? Do you know anything about it? Do you have an opinion about it? And I said, of course, I'd love to work with you, Billy. You're unbelievable at what you do. And it would be in my best interest for people to understand what's going on with this soccer deal because it's so different than the Marlins Park deal. It's so much worse. Billy sent me the script. I made one or two tiny changes that Billy actually accepted, which made me feel like a writer. And then we filmed it. And Billy put together a piece of education in two and a half minutes that has certainly uh, found some eyes. Yeah. Uh, Billy, as you know oh so well, the most cutting criticism is satire and making fun of people, getting people to laugh about your opponent. And, you know, hats off to you. I mean, you have done it with this little clip. Uh, and yet there are people who say, hey, you know, it's not such a bad deal for the city of Miami. They would get six and a half billion dollars in revenue over the course of uh, this lease. 
What, what is your opposition to turning Mel Reese Golf Course uh, into this big complex? Well, first and foremost, the goal was to drag this out of the shady back rooms and into the sunshine where the community could be better informed about what was happening with their property. We can have a more transparent and accountable process, which now it seems that's improving. But the great thing about Miami is that there's so there's something for everyone, right? We have ballpark and a basketball arena, performing arts center, museums, a golf course. None of those things is for everyone, but there's something for all the diverse interests here. And I so I'd love to see a soccer stadium here in Miami, whether I ever go or not. I've never been to Ultra, I never will be, but I'm glad that it's that it's here. And to that end, why don't we give um, Moss and Beckham and Inter Fort Lauderdale the exclusive no bid access, which they uh, are you know are entitled to by uh, the referendum, right at Mel Reese and and you know to the property that they need for the soccer stadium and reasonable parking. But why don't we then separate out everything else, the hotel, the office park, the retail component, maybe even affordable housing if we're feeling bold and, and useful into individual commercial projects and then put those out for bid. Moss and Beckham can certainly participate in that uh, bidding. And that way the people of Miami who own that property will have a chance to get fair market value through a legitimate competitive process. And that's how free market capitalism uh, works. Not so I, I don't want to, uh, you know, I certainly don't want to speak on behalf of anybody, uh, Becca, Moss or anything like that. But having covering, having covered the story, I do know what their answer would likely be is that the entire component is the funding mechanism yeah. for the soccer component. So the, the whole shebang is needed in in their words to to make it work but so this has nothing to do point. with soccer then yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah David, that's the whole point that, that therefore it's a real estate deal and not a soccer deal when we were doing marlins park it was a simply for a ballpark we didn't have the rights to anything around the ballpark we weren't buying land in little havana at all and the way to look at this deal if you are a, a member of miami or a voter in miami how many people are lining up to do the exact deal that jorge moss and david beckham are getting from the city you've got developers left right and center how many people were lining up to buy the marlins back in 2002 when john henry wanted to leave Nobody locally. How many people were lining up to put their money into a stadium deal, just a unique stadium deal? Nobody. And Jorge Mas would not do a standalone stadium deal and fund it privately because you cannot compete without public funding for your stadium. So the way around it is to say we're building the stadium with private funds, but look, we're getting money over here. Okay, yeah. hold, hold on a second. So if there's no way to fund the stadium without public money, what you did was is cost Miami-Dade taxpayers over the course of probably my children's lifetime, again, no judgment here, but what you did <laughs> really did cost a lot of money that I'm going to venture a guess most voters had no idea was going to come at them, which Five, is why a mayor was recalled $500 million dollars in bond debt, and then when you pay the interest, and it comes out to roughly a billion dollars. And so why then, what's wrong with getting a private enterprise to take that land and do it on its own instead of bonding something out for generations? I think there's a couple of things you have to keep in mind about Marlins Park deal, and then we'll talk about Mel Reese. Number one, your children will pay for it if, in fact, they stay in hotels in Miami. So they may, so that would be a factor. But it did not come from general funds. It came from an existing tax stream that can only go to ballparks and to convention centers. And that actually comes from Tallahassee. as part. It's part of the legislature. So here in Mel Reese... Here's what we're trying to do and why I said yes and why Billy's so brilliant. We're just trying to get people understanding the issue. And the issue is, is this the best deal that the city can get for that amount of land, not including the soccer stadium? Because I agree with publicly funding and having a partnership to build a sports facility, but I don't believe that the owner of a sports team should have the right to develop the land around it for below market value. Yeah. Billy, I of course, uh, disag I of course yeah, disagree with with David Sampson, and I don't want to relitigate Marlins Park, but I think there's a, a I th which I think is the, was the worst deal, sports welfare deal in history at the time before Buffalo <laughs> Bills and now before Mel Reese. But I do want to say there is an important history lesson there. Right now, Miami Commissioner Manolo Reyes is the one person yeah. to do the right thing and stick to his guns. All eyes now are on Commissioner Ken Russell. He is the swing vote here, and he has the power to end this bad deal. And if he doesn't, it will end his political career. Nobody who voted 
for the Marlins Park boondoggle ever achieved higher office again. And I would remind everyone, and especially Ken Russell, that over 10 years ago, Tomas Regalado was the lone dissenting vote on the Miami City Commission against Marlins Park. And he was elected city mayor because of that. In Miami-Dade County, Mayor Carlos Alvarez, parlay, uh, I'm sorry, he championed Marlins Park, uh, then got recalled for it. Yeah. And then County Commissioner Carlos Jimenez parlayed his opposition to the deal right into the county mayor's office for 10 years yeah. and then the well, United States Congress. So history like, proves yeah. that if Ken Russell supports this public uh, sports welfare, public land grab, his aspirations for higher office yeah. are over and Ken Russell will be finished. Yeah, well, let's point out, as you were really saying, it takes four yes votes to make the deal work and they may or not vote on Thursday. I know Glenna and I have been down there numerous times <laughs> when they were supposed to vote and they've never voted so we'll see what happens on thursday sit tight break time we'll be back <laughs> in two welcome back we are having a very lively robust conversation as you would expect with billy corbin filmmaker extraordinaire 537 votes the u and many others and david sampson who was the president of uh, the Marlins. And we should point out, point out for anybody who is saying, where is a voice in favor of the Miami Freedom Park deal? Well, I think Lena and I would say, David Beckham, Jorge Mas have all been on this program. Mayor Francis Suarez, they've all given their reasons why they support it. So it's not exactly a one-sided deal. The uh, Billy, the uh, Inter Miami, the soccer club, did issue a statement and it said, I'll just read a bit, Miami Freedom Park is a 100% privately funded project that would create the single largest park in the city of Miami. But, you know, it, we're not talking about a park, you know, just a big green space. I mean, there would be soccer fields, however, in addition to the soccer stadium. The vast majority of that 131 acres, though, is going to be paved over uh, with concrete. That's just a fact. And I saw their... Uh, their infographic, uh, and I'm a big fan of science fiction, so I read it. Um, and uh, you know, some of it is just manipulated uh, economic impact studies, which you can ask any legitimate economist will tell you is pie in the sky nonsense. And the rest of it is four-year-old uh, statistics that are either half truths, uh, outright lies, or one has to wonder why isn't the deal better now in 2022 than it was in uh, 2018. You have to remember that in the first week of January of this year, uh, Mayor Ponzi Postalita, Francis Suarez, came out to the press and said, the deal is done, it's good to go, and it is the best deal for the city. Well, that was in January. What was the rent back then? Just this week, in response to our mini documentary, uh, Francis uh, said, well, of course, we're going to do a reassessment of the property to reevaluate the rent. Well, when? The vote is on Thursday, and you said three months ago that this was the best deal. So this guy, you know, Francis Suarez, as in the words of Manolo Reyes, he is wearing an inter-Miami jersey in this deal, not a city of Miami jersey in this deal. And he is working as the private personal realtor to uh, Jorge Moss and David Beckham. Uh, when and, we and were negotiating... Record. I'm, I'm sorry, when we were negotiating the stadium deal, we had a bunch of voices like Billy Corbin's or like Norman Brayman's, and they were making a lot of noise, some including lawsuits, and we only felt we had to respond if we still needed votes in the county commission or city commission, and we didn't feel, we, we felt we had the votes because we felt it was a good deal, both sides did, so we never would have responded the way Inter-Miami did. So by them responding, that means to me that they do not yet have that fourth vote. Well, actually, I think they responded as an answer to a question for yeah. response rather than just yeah. say no comment. I don't think they just came yeah. out on their own, to your point, and said anything. But no, but, the, but, they, but they've also refused and turned down interviews to be cross-examined on any of those talking points from their infographic. They haven't appeared live. They've just been sort of texting people behind the scenes, but don't actually want to address the issues. And I would say it doesn't matter what's in our two minute mini doc and it doesn't matter what's on their sci fi infographic. It just matters what's in the contract. And that that's what it comes down to. And and I don't begrudge Jorge Moss and David Beckham and Inter Fort Lauderdale for wanting to negotiate the best possible deal for their side. That's their job is to make money for them. They're not they're not do gooders. They're not a nonprofit. They're not a charity. They want to make the most money that they can make. My concern is who is sitting on our side of the table, who yeah. is actually representing the taxpayers and is qualified 
qualified to negotiate the biggest real estate deal in Miami history. So so that's a very interesting point. And, and David, there are in this lease that was sort of put out, some people got it. It's not on the website of the city yet. So it's not a, an official public document, but it is available to the public for anyone who wanted to see it, is this framework for the lease agreement that was supposed to be in front of the, the city commission now uh, three or four times, and maybe this week it will be. But in, in that, along with uh, that comes a memo from the city's own attorneys that identified 28 issues, problems with this lease deal uh, that the city's own attorneys are telling the commissioners about to vote on it are there. Uh, I frankly, and I'm not sure I know anyone who has, figured out what all 28 are and whether they've been addressed. But, but speaking from, from someone in your position who's been there, done that, if 28 issues in a 99-year in a lease agreement were not figured out, how on earth does this go to a vote on Thursday? So 28 is actually a pretty low number. Our issues list was often in the hundreds over the years. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're going back and forth from the, at the time it was the either the city manager or the county manager to the commissioners, always one at a time because you never wanted to meet in the sunshine, as Billy would say. And you're going through issues that matter to the commissioners. And the question is, what will it take to get you to a yes? With a commissioner like Tomas Regalado, there was nothing you could put in there, so there aren't a lot of meetings that take place. But when there are commissioners who are on the fence, you go through the issues list and you say, okay, are you a yes if we go to this place or that place with these issues? Then you go back and negotiate with Moss's team and with Beckham's team, and that back and forth continues. But what you see in the final document, that's going to be summarized for the commissioners, but at the end of the day, the devil is actually in the details of the executed agreement. Mm -hmm. Well, the executed agreement apparently is so complex, so big, that that's the way, that's the reason why they've had to postpone any kind of a vote because lawyers on both sides, you know, have said we're not finished with it and we'll see. These commissioners, these commissioners are going to vote on it without ever having read it or understood it. Are you sure? After, after this documentary, you don't think they're, no. I, listen, they're sitting I, I at think their dining I, room table going through it with a fine What are they going to get it Wednesday uh, I, night? I, uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, I think they have three votes, and I think this is all on Ken Russell's shoulders, and he has to make a decision about his fate and his political future. So can I just, uh, I, I'm not sure we have it to put up, but at the end of this two-minute mini documentary, you say call the commissioners, and, that, and there's a number. That's Ken Russell's number. Oh, I didn't, I hadn't noticed that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Listen, the, the the pitfalls of being a of being a swing vote. It's my understanding that his office got quite a few calls about this, telling Ken Russell not to bend over for Beckham. Yeah, uh, David, um, I've known you for years. Uh, I find you kind of a charmingly pugnacious guy. Uh, I like going around and around that, with you when uh, you and your former, you know, father-in-law were running the Marlins. Uh, what's the reaction been? around your neighborhood or with your friends for you appearing in Billy's uh, documentary here? Well, I have a show on CBS called Nothing Personal with David Sampson. It's a daily show where I talk about sports and culture and politics yeah. and anything else I want to. And I've spoken about stadium issues before. And my whole point with the show, and it's my point here with Miami and with this mini doc, is to educate people, to get people to read, to listen, to learn, to watch your show, actually, so they can understand what's going on. Because people in the private sector tend to take advantage of those who are ignorant, not because they're not smart, because yeah. they don't know where to look or what to look for and in my position now i can show people where to look and how to look and well, billy is perfect at communicating that message well gentlemen we really appreciate you and uh we'll see what happens if indeed they vote this week uh, billy david thanks very much great to have you both see you guys and we'll be right back To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, take your phone, scan this QR code right there on the screen, and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. Thank you so much for being with us here. Remember, we are online all the time at Local10.com. And as always, stay informed, get involved.